Oh, there we go. Okay, all participants can share. Yeah. Okay. Oh, very cool. Should we give it a try now? Yeah. Great. So, yeah. So this is just a a small little map um, that I created just to kind of give orient people around where our homelands are located. So. Tahoe is at the center of our homelands. And then we say Da'al, which just means lake. Um, but I always say this is the, this area that has no green shadow on it is kind of our undisputed territory. This area is more like our disputed territory, but, um, or like shared territory. But I think the anthropologists say that it's our secondary resource area or something, resource use area. But um, it goes, I, I guess like our our, fam, our our family, our our people traveled a lot by foot over both sides of the Sierras. And when it comes to water, the one thing that I think is really, I guess like representative of how I feel like our, our responsibility to water is, is that our homelands are the location of the headwaters of so many different important rivers that, I mean, even, you know, today help, you know, feed millions of people, um, but they all kind of start within our homelands or there's the headwaters often start in our homelands. And so that's something that I always, when I'm talking to kind of our younger generations or talking to the general public about water. I mean, it's, you know, we know that it obviously doesn't follow any type of political boundaries, but it also is something that really, you know, when we really think about it and get to the bottom of it, um, it's something that really connects us and kind of how we, we all have that relationship to each other or that responsibility to each other, especially when it comes to our water. And so I just wanted to share that really quickly. And then these are, they're highlighted, but the Carson River and then the Truckee River, I just highlight, highlighted those because those are still important areas to like our modern reservation lands, which are um, pretty small. But those are the areas where, well, the Carson River specifically is the only area where we still have like actual water rights to the water um, and kind of one of our main focuses as far as a lot of like the tribes water quality type of work. Um, but it is, I don't know, it's a, um, it is a, I don't wanna say a challenge, but you know, um, when it comes to water rights, it's a little bit tricky where we're at just because our water rights are all basically for agriculture and we're not, um, we're not a traditionally, traditionally in like an agriculture tribe. We were no, more nomadic hunter gatherer. Um, and so something that we have been talking more about, I think at the tribal leadership level is also looking into, um, because on the, the up in the upper watershed of the Carson River, there's Leviathan Mine, which is a super fun site and um, impacts both tribal lands and impacts the water itself. So people don't really fish in the river. Um, there's been a lot of loss, like cultural losses related to contamination in that area, even though that river is still important for us for, I mean, right now for agriculture, but um, for other other things too, for our ceremonies and whatnot. But we've been more talking about like quantifying cultural loss due to contamination um, as a way to try to um, get some of that back, I guess. Um, our previous leadership, so since like the 1990s, um, our tribal leadership has been really trying to, um, I don't, I guess like settle is not the, the right word, but has been trying to 
Um, work on getting the area cleaned up uh, as much as we can. And we've been really involved in those um, processes to advocate for cleanup of the, the Leviathan area and work closely, I guess, with the EPA and stuff. Um, but then have also been trying to advocate for actual like compensation for loss, the losses that our, our people have experienced because of the contamination, um, which is very tricky. And, and that mine itself has been Ex like changed in ownership and things like that and um which happens often right you know like the mines get created the people who created it or the companies that created it declare bankruptcy and then somebody else is somebody becomes somebody else's responsibility to clean it up or to, to right. address right. The issues. no one is there to be responsible yeah. to clean it up at the end of the day except the yeah which I think we're a little bit lucky in some respects, just because um, there has been a, a multi-jurisdictional effort in this area to try to clean it up. It's it's a little bit, you know, like the local county um, in Alpine County has been really involved in um, a lot of, you know, the public and, and some of the agencies that are the local agencies have been wanting to work more as a team than be kind of against each other. Whereas you don't see that in all areas, um, especially in like more rural areas. So I think we're a little bit lucky, but still kind of one of our, our big water issues, I guess. Yeah. What other uh, communities depend on that, um, on those water resources? like? Um, are there urban, uh, is Reno where, I'm, I'm a little lost, but um, maybe you can explain that. Yeah, so that, in the map that I showed, the Northern River um, is the Truckee River, and that's the one that comes, it's the only drainage from Tahoe, and that's, that one goes through Reno, and so Reno depends on it, and then it goes all the way to Pyramid Lake, and so the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe is on the other end of that one and um, that river is a very important river for a lot of different reasons, but especially I would say for Washu people and then the Northern or, you know, at the beginning of it and then for Paiute people at the end, Pyramid Lake has a, it's a, in the Great Basin. And so it has high salinity. Um, and when it has less Part of the Truckee was diverted to Fallon um, to support out agriculture, which it never was before. And then when that happened, the, the lake levels dropped in Pyramid Lake significantly. And Pyramid Lake's important um, as like a fishing area and fish spawning. Um, the Lahontan cutthroat trout used to travel all the way up to Tahoe um, from that area and kind of back and forth. And now they're a little bit more separated just because there's not enough water. But um, when the salinity goes up, it starts to kill off the fish. And so Walker Lake is an example of a lake that um, water has been diverted so heavily for agriculture in the upper area that it's now too salty um, to support the native fish in the area. I think they do have, they do kind of I think that they stock it, but um, I don't want to say, but it, they're like most important native fish in that area was the Lahat and cutthroat trout and it can't survive there anymore. Um, and then the Carson River, which is the one that Leviathan is at the headwaters of or in the upper watershed of, um, that one goes through the Carson Valley and Carson City. Carson City is the capital of Nevada, and then it ends up, um, the Carson Sink is where the Fallon Paiute Shoshone tribe is located, and that area used to be a, like a huge wetlands, like a huge kind of a, I don't want to say a swamp, but a huge wetlands, um, and because of diversion and whatnot, they don't, and, and drought years, they don't quite get as much water as they used to either. And then in Fallon, the Paiute Shoshone tribe, I would say that's a, when it comes to water quality, they 
by the time the water hits their community, this, you know, fresh water system that's coming through, um, it doesn't meet hardly any of the water quality standards that like federal water quality standards that have been set forth. But there's not a lot they can do at like the bottom of the watershed um, to try to address that. Like they have to start holding other people accountable to address it. And it's such a, I don't want to say a contentious issue, but it is such a big endeavor that um, they kind of do what they can to to mitigate things in, at that location. But um, it's one of the things um, I wanted to ask you about actually is the um it's something that, that we see in a lot of different places in the southwest um where water comes from the mountains yeah. and is transported really long distances to, to urban communities that don't necessarily uh always understand that relationship it's not very visible it's not um, something that um is easy to conceptualize. And um, in many cases, that's a relationship between urban communities and rural communities, but also um, tribal resources in, in the case of a lot of water. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. And like, I mean, on a small scale, it's, I would say, where we're located, one of our, I think, because we're so high up in the water right watershed and we don't have our water at this level isn't being diverted like in like Owens Valley I think is a perfect example of where it's actually the diversion and like the pumps and the aqueducts have really like removed like that is a significant loss of their culture whereas where we're at we don't quite have that same um water isn't, I guess water isn't being diverted from our homelands, but it is impacting those those lower tribes and then kind of like those mid-region tribes um, for sure. And I, I think that it is something that we are also concerned about and also like, you know, wanna be allies to, um, but it's something, but to give an example, I think as far as like that disconnect goes is even to the degree that um, people come up to Tahoe, one of our, I would say, Tahoe is like our most sacred area in our homelands. Um, and to us, it's really like a, a spiritual place to be and a place like a sanctuary to be. But you go up there now and it's just you, millions and millions of tourists every single year. And last year it was particularly bad because people weren't flying to vacation. So people were coming from these cities and, you know, driving from these cities to vacation in Tahoe and like the trash and the like overflowing trash bins, just like tourism was as it's completely uncontrolled and it's kind of, there aren't mechanisms to control it and to keep it in track in, in check. Um, but just like people were, horrible to our land to like our most sacred area and and that's the area where they're actually coming there to enjoy the beauty but then trashing it and then really don't have any like connection to the fact that like this water system is also what I depend on downriver like I'm going to trash this even though like like you don't spit in the wind I mean people know that but like they don't quite see it. like to me that's like such an obvious disconnect in, in an area where so yeah I guess like it's like to me just also shows how important it is to start not to start but to keep like educating people about where their water comes from and what it takes to actually protect these areas and then what it takes like how like encouraging or protecting tribal sovereignty or tribal management of this area also improves the water down down river um to like i don't know i don't want to say like like i think that there's just such a that disconnect is so severe and when you think like in an area where it should be obvious it's still disconnected um 
yeah, I don't know. And particularly right now, when we're experiencing a mega drought in the whole Southwest region, it seems like we need to develop new ways of understanding that responsibility. Um, over, well, I guess one question I have is, is you know, the, can you describe the extent to which the super drought that we're experiencing right now is human caused over the, the, the last hundred years? Yes, and so, I mean, we're talking the super drought, and I think one of the reasons why they're calling it that, it's not just, you know, lack of precipitation, it's the, you know, big reasons are also that it's an increase in heat and so an increase in evap evaporation. And so um, there's a lot of little, there's a lot of different things that people um, are doing that have contributed to this in more ways. And I think all of those little things are great places to start to try to address this because it's, you know, we have this impending, not impending, but we have this huge impact of climate change of this, you know, it's extreme temperatures that are, it's going to evaporate water at higher levels and we're going to have less water. Um, and then there's all the little things that make it even more challenging. And I think on the, you know, the west side and, you know, the California area, um, the depletion of the aquifers has, we had we have the issue in Nevada too, but we just have less population, and so it's not quite as profound. Um, but the depletion of the aquifers, like that's a huge water storage, um, and something that is not being replenished at a rate that it can be. So even when we don't, even when we're not in a drought, when it seems like we have enough precipitation, when the surface water and the reservoirs are full, there's still that negative water, that negative, like that misting water in those aquifers. And I don't think people realize like, that's another thing, right? Where it's like out of sight, out of mind, you don't see groundwater. So they're not, you know, can't think about it. Um, it's not as profound, um, but without that water storage, without that being replenished, then you know, no matter what, you still have negative water overall. Um, you know, I think that they call it like your water footprint now too, is like how much um, water gets used. But but in a, a general water system, you know, you have to look at all of these different sources. And then when you think about drought and how that relates to it, it's like before we were over pumping and overusing our water sources or, you know, putting, had such a huge demand on them, a drought year wasn't as devastating. And I come from this perspective as like a, more from like an ecological perspective. In our homelands, a lot of our plants and medicines and our people were, um, they're adapted to, to drought. You know, it's okay to have a few drought years here and there, the plants are gonna come back because they're used to that because that's been a common system. But now that we've depleted so much water, then it's not, it's, there's just not enough there anymore. Um, and then one of the things that I've been kind of, that this is a, a much more like smaller scale impact of water, but that we're seeing a larger, I guess it has a smaller relationship as far as like overall water availability, but that we're seeing, you know, being impacted huge, especially during these drought years. And that's our overgrown forest due to the lack of like traditional fire, cultural fire that used to come through and kind of keep our forests, you know, more spacious and more, I guess, in a condition that was better for, for human use pre-colonization. And when we have these overgrown forests, not only are like, they are sucking up more water. And so the trees are water restricted just because of like competition. And then in drought years, it kind of takes them beyond that scape, like beyond the scope of what they can handle as far as, um, you know, a healthy ecosystem. And then we see these catastrophic fires come through during these drought years, high wind events, high 
key events. Um, and then, you know, we're all impacted by that too. And so I think like there's a lot of little things that we need to be looking at and trying to start to build solutions around um, and at much larger scales, right? Like we're, we're no longer at this like, you know, turn your lights off more often. What I can do as an individual is not quite enough. It's got to be much, you know, regional, at a regional scale, um, regional. And I mean, when we're talking climate change too, we're talking international. And then when we're talking some of these other larger watersheds, you're even talking about, you know, international issues. I mean, like the Colorado River, um, that's a, another one that's, you know, a huge water source for the Southwest, but is, you know, has other implications too. And so, yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know if I for sure answered that question, but. Well, something you touched on that I think is really interesting is that uh, um, it's a, a vast geographic area and it needs to be treated um, that way, but it's also a kind of um, longer duration of time that we need to start thinking about. Um, when you talk about fire, I think one of the disconnects that we have is um, realizing we're in the middle of a drought and these fires are becoming now a, a, not just a seasonal occurrence, but a year round occurrence. And there's a lot of fear with that. And I think that people um, have a hard time understanding that um, more fire, a little fire more often is <laughs> better than um, this buildup of fuels and um, forks yeah. to the point where you have also mega fires. Yeah, no, and I think that that's like, like the fear of inaction, right? Like what, whether, um, or I would say like the fear that creates inaction and like the importance of education and the importance of success stories and the importance of like celebrating some of those little wins that we have like, you know, in our work because, you know, some so these issues are massive and we all have like a, a small part of trying to address them. Um, and it's can be, you know, a huge weight when you are working towards solutions, um, to like feel like when you let yourself feel, feel the full, you know, burden. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, like it's human nature or something. I, like I don't haven't studied psychology or anything like that. Like I'm definitely environmental science, but, um, but yeah, the human human nature, and, and I think when you have decades of certain types of messaging that you get used to, I mean, whether it was Smokey the Bear, people talking about it, and like, um, I mean, that's the one of the things too, as far as like indigenous rights to land stewardship, um, indigenous stewardship, I mean, there was a lot of negative messaging around that. I mean, natives were, uncivilized managing the land was like it was un like no everybody believed that people were away from the land they weren't managing it and so even kind of reclaiming um the importance of having humans within the ecosystem doing things that are important like ecosystem services i mean humans also damage our ecosystems severely if you do it wrong but but yeah, I think it's like what our current generation generations are dealing with is like years and years of lies. I mean, no, I don't want to say it like that, but that's really what it is. And lies that were built out of ignorance, I guess, and fear and um, like, you know, people, maybe they didn't mean to lie. It wasn't that they always had like a political agenda or something like that. But um, when push comes to shove, I, I mean, we're trying to create solutions in a time of ignorance, in a time where there should be like 
we have the whole world information about the entire world at our fingertips and our phones and things like that but knowing how to access that knowing how to get connected to it in the right ways um i think is is a huge challenge but yeah fire is one of i think a perfect example of um we can either try to address things with small scale fire or we can deal with these catastrophic mega fires that you know people you know it costs human life and eco, you know not to mention the ecological devastation of it um and and it is scary because like in our our lands and on the nevada side we we have too much fire it's it's an area where um there was definitely some significant i guess like encroachment or overgrowth of our our trees um we have pinion juniper trees they're not like the timber trees and they're not like tolerant to fire mm -hmm. so if you did try to do like a small understory burn it would kill the trees too and that's not something that like we want to do or could do but then when these major fires go through then the whole area gets replaced with cheat grass which is a like super bad invasive um and then we can't get anything else to grow there because it just cheat grass and then you get another fire and then the cheat grass comes back because it, it spreads fire like no other. Um, and so that's a, a scary, scary area about trying to build solutions to it's a lot of like people hours to try to try to make better. Whereas in the Sierras around the Tahoe Basin and up into those bigger forested areas, like we can, we should be able to to use fire as a tool in better ways, bigger ways to start to address the, the overgrowth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is a long-term uh, multi-generational kind of project to start to restore those ecosystems. So yeah. Fire. Right. Yeah, definitely. Especially trees. I mean, we're talking hundreds of years for a tree to get established, right? Um, or to get to mature maturity. And so we're not planting these for us, we're planting them for future generations. Um, and I mean, yeah. that's always yeah. exciting too. When you see the photo, I've seen some comparisons of like early photographs of um, forest landscapes where the trees are really big and they're spaced far apart. Yeah. And through colonial fire suppression, there was a whole different attitude and all that space got filled in with a lot of underbrush. And you can see how that becomes a problem and then how to, many of those large trees are gone, of course, now. And so um, to, to have the patience and understanding to let that landscape rebalance is um, a challenge. Sure. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it, it kind of, it's harder every time we go back to like that public perception, right? Like trying to get people to understand at a small scale or at a, you know, regional scale, even how important that is. And I think that we're finally seeing a shift at least in California um, as far as some like the decision makers go like at a political level, there's been more money that's been earmarked for like tribal use and tribal fire use and um, trying to address some of the um, policies, I guess, around uh, how to use it better or not how to use it, but address like, cause there's a lot of fire suppression policies that make things really hard um but yeah i and sorry to talk so much about fire i this last year i've been more i was working for my tribe and um i was tasked with trying to develop kind of a fire cultural fire revitalize our cultural fire um efforts or what that looked like and um but it is it is related to water and to drought um 
because I mean everything's interconnected, but it is, it is. And, and also oil. You know, one of the things yeah. that um, I think is really interesting right now with you know the, the decision to um, cancel the KXL pipeline, for example, is that we're slowly starting to see um, a, a, I guess uh, the power of the um, resistance movements, first of all, and then a willingness at a political level to actually take tribal sovereignty seriously and to think about um, that it's that there's there's actually a decision being made between oil and water and not just yeah. focus on profit but to realize there's actually a long-term equation here um you have yeah I, I, well i guess the question that i had around that would be um kind of how you know again like how how um can projects like this, you know, the KXL pipeline is something that kind of crosses the continent. Um, how can um, local communities uh, understand and, and work at that scale? Um, yeah, I think that it's one of the things that I think has been huge about the organization behind, you know, stopping some of those devastating pipelines was that it showed that because so imminent domain, right, is that big word that makes everyone scared. And when um, like those pipelines go through, they really do it in a way where they they get everybody that would be in favor for it in favor for it. They threaten them with, you know, some of these bigger things where it's like, you know, you can either we can either pay you this much to let us go through your land or you know your territory or your back you know your backyard your city um or we're going to do it anyway once we get all the permits approved and i think what a lot of this organization you know in these rural areas has done has shown people that like they're not alone that you know by having those conversations at a regional scale by bringing attention to it, whether you know, you don't, you're not immediately affected by it or not, but by raising awareness around that, I think it it has really shown like how much power collectives can have, and if that's something that you weren't necessarily like that you don't want. I mean, nobody wants a leaking pipeline in their backyard. Um, I think it it shows that they're. I think what it's really shown was that, you know, they can take action and try to work together with other people to address it. And I think when it comes to indigenous communities taking the lead on that, it, it's huge because there's a lot more, it's, it's huge, it's tricky, but there's what I, how I kind of describe a lot of like indigenous communities is that we do like polit policy wise is that sometimes we have a lot less rights because a lot of Indian law was established kind of in the idea that to terminate tribes, but at the same time, Indian law was established at a federal level. And so there's a, a much more immediate um, connection to the feds than an individual who lives off reservation in a county or city where they kind of have to follow a, a lot larger, I guess, chain of command before what they say or think or believe can get to that federal level, um, which is, I think, good and, good and bad because they also, a lot of times, tribes get more impacted by the political swing, whereas at a local level, you can can act. Um, you know, there's it takes a lot longer for things to change or be impacted by the federal polit politics. Um, there's a little less of a swing there, shift there, but but yeah, I think it it's been huge, and I think in a lot of part, a lot of things as far as like hope goes, um, we're starting to see a shift when it comes to 
like these conversations about oil or these conversations in general, you know, we're, we're talking, we're not only talking about addressing climate change. I would say like 10 years ago, a lot of the conversations around climate change, a lot of the conversations around like what people can do in Earth Day and things like that were happening kind of in spaces where people had the privilege to um, for that to be a concern, I guess. It's like uh, a lot of the people that were pushing for that were people who can afford um, to make some of the personal sacrifices to start to address it. Whereas since then, you know, I think a lot of the conversation, I don't want to say that it's been shifted, but I think that there's been a lot bigger emphasis put on like environmental justice because climate change doesn't impact somebody who lives in the nice part of cities um, as much as it's going to impact somebody who lives, you know, closer to the land and closer to those resources and who has already been impacting for, you know, years now, whereas other people are just now experiencing some of those those impacts. And so I think that that's been exciting. That's been, I think when you had, when you have like people of color kind of leading a lot of these, these issues and showing, leading a lot of the conversations and the efforts to address it, I think, you know, and in, in some ways we've been experiencing the impacts of climate change, the impacts of degradation and contamination. I mean, it's like water quality in low income communities, even in urban areas is less than, is always lower. I mean, than like the wealthier areas. Um, in Reno, for example, the climate hotspots or the heat hotspots, it's, a, it's an area without very many trees and the hot spots are all in the low income communities and the cooler areas. So like even at that that lower kind of microclimate area, the cooler areas are um, you know, the wealthier parts of town. And so I think people are finally seeing that, realizing that, and talking about solutions at that level too. Um, and so I think that it's been you know, nothing's been happening fast um, as far as solutions go. It's taken years and years and years. I mean, I've been watching COVID. I started watching, you know, we started watching some older movies and like you really get to, to realize like this conversation, even if it's been a side conversation about climate change, has been people have been searching for change at a political level at this larger scale since the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. And there hasn't been a lot of action and even, and so now a lot of the efforts, you know, to address it feel futile. They, they feel like they, you know, maybe they would have been solutions back then and now we're have a much bigger issue, but. Well, these issues have been, um, people have been speaking about it for decades. And yeah. one of the, the examples that I find really inspiring right now is um, what happened also with the Southern Nevada Water Authority pipeline. Yeah. This is a story that not a lot of people have, have noticed. It's really gone kind of under the radar, but it was a $15 billion project. And for 30 years, it was resisted by a grassroots um, coalition, but really, to me, um, a, a crucial part of this story is is the Goshu tribe, and a small number of very committed elders who have worked on that and told that story. It's really just a form of storytelling because it's also a, a community that's um, very small. The Goshu reservation is like 500 people um, and uh, with not a lot of resources, but they kept telling the story of what would happen to that unique, globally unique um, cultural and ecological resource if 
this project went ahead. And, you know, I've been watching it for know, maybe five years. And I always felt like, wow, you know, this is really David and Goliath. You know, there's no way that this is actually going to be resisted. And then there's Trump years where, you know, it really seemed like this is going ahead. And just in last year, it seems that the project has been blocked and um, definitively kind of overturned in a lot of ways. And I'm just amazed. I'm really yeah. amazed. Yeah, I think, and I, I, I wish that I was more involved in some of those things, but like you said, it, I mean, it's been 30 years in the making. Um, and, and I think like you're saying, David and Goliath, it was huge. I mean, and on a like policy level. So this is the part where like water policy doesn't actually, oh, it's so hard to like say it, but water policy, even though it's been devastating, it can be devastating for these smaller communities, but it really typically is like, goes to the voters and the bigger populations, despite the fact that like Las Vegas shouldn't exist because it's in a desert and there's not enough water or resources to have it exist. But politically, um, un like they were able to develop and unsustainably um, for decades. And then because the population so high, I thought for sure, like eventually they were going to win out was that, you know, the voting class was going to outbid or outbeat these smaller rural communities that were going to be impacted, like devastated by that decision. Um, so I wasn't, I was in the same boat. I mean, when it comes to oil, I think it's a little bit different because that's something that's, that I think is easier for small communities to show the risks um, on their livelihoods without it being kind of as big of a, a or as pertinent of a need. But with that, with that case, it was that that same thing as far as like how like will they like will this end in a in a in a way that really does protect kind of these smaller communities that are, have worked so hard just to barely make it, right? Like these, they work so hard every single day to live in these areas. And it, it was the Goshute tribe leading it, but then it was also like, they were able to build that collaboration with the, the small ranching community and really had it not be like a, um, yeah, it was not, it was a let's work together type of a, an issue. And I would say, I, I think, what, it is exciting because I, I do see that quite a bit in Nevada. Um, there isn't as much kind of like opposite sides, but, but yeah, that was huge because po the policy, the water rights, I mean, Las Vegas had already bought the water rights to a bunch of those, like the, the groundwater rights that they needed in order to feed the pipeline. And so they already had a lot of the things that they needed in place on that like political and power, like power and policy level um, that it took so much effort. I mean, it just took like, like you're saying, like this relentless effort to share their stories, to share the beauty to, um, and like the level of, I always like, like the generosity of those elders to like share that knowledge too um because they knew how important it would be because i think that that's something a lot of indigenous communities struggle with because cultural appropriation is like so such a, a huge issue where people appropriate indigenous knowledge and then make millions off of it leaving these communities kind of defend for themselves. But I think that that was a really beautiful story of like, you know, the generosity to share 
their stories, to share their knowledge, to share like the importance of the, you know, their homelands and of those areas, like the swamp cedars themselves and um, to share, you know, videos, to share their songs. Like, um, I think that that was, was really beautiful uh, in so many different ways and really showed how, um, like building that compassion through that generosity can make huge like leaps and bounds um, and in an area where it was like everything was stacked against them all the all the chips were stacked against them and they still to make that fight in a good way yeah it's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful story and it's it didn't um it never became confrontational somehow like yeah. there wasn't a, 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 a protest movement wasn't even really needed because the, the um there was a kind of um uh i think consciousness um yeah. slowly developed around what those issues really meant and um it also it, it just gives um, I think a vision of what uh, maybe indigenous infrastructure at that scale could be, yeah. you know, that um, there are other ways of um, coping with um, our water needs than just extraction. Yeah. And like it broke precedence, like you're saying, like it, it was, you know, it wasn't a, wasn't your traditional direct action or what we'd imagine your traditional direct action, like protest movement. It wasn't it, in so many different areas, it broke precedence in a way to give us like hope for collaborative action or hope for, you know, we don't, hope for other areas to to have similar solutions or similar outcomes um that are good and positive and and that's the thing too with i think a big push like policy wise was just to understand like most of the infrastructure in las vegas is recent like within the last 20 years 30 years mm -hmm. maybe but like reno was the big city 40 years ago um it's been, it's like the, the development in Vegas has skyrocketed, it's so new. Um, so they haven't, I think part of this conversation was, was that they, they haven't explored like water reduction or like conservation. They went right to pipeline. And I think that was also um, kind of a big case for halting the line, like, you know, halting it was, let's explore some of these other options first, try to explore some of those other options. Um, and they wanted to kind of be that power push and thought that being a bully was gonna be the best solution. But yeah, it was, was a good. <laughs> yeah, it's important yeah. to have these um, victories, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, other other ways uh, forward because um, yeah. it's the challenges are are significant right now. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, um, this has really been amazing. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge about this. Um, if there's anything else, I mean, um, that you'd like to talk about? Um, I think, I guess, I just want to kind of just touch on a little bit about, like, um, kind of like the when it comes to contending with these larger populations or these larger interests, um, like one of the things that I think 
is most important to our people and and I think most important for like the health of our our homelands is having more rights or say over like water policy or water resources. Um, and with Washu people, like Tahoe is, like I said, the center of our homeland and, and something that we've been really, our, you know, our tribal leaders for decades, for years, I mean, centuries, I guess, um, have been really fighting for more of a say in, in how the the basin is managed and, and what resources it's managed for. And when it comes to, when it comes, a lot of times I get frustrated with the conversations because a lot of times the conversations are talk about how important it is for tourism to be in the area so that they have the money to um, protect the land. Whereas tourism is kind of that greatest impact to the lake, um, greatest like pressure, pre creates so much pressure for trying to preserve the, the clarity and the quality of not only the lake, but the ecosystems that surround it. Um, and something that I think, you know, with Washu people, tourism also has prevented us from being able to practice our traditional like ceremonies and things at the lake's edge, because when you go to those areas, it's, you have hundreds of tourists out there drinking or partying and like access, like we don't have the option to, to prevent access um, or to like block off a little area where then a family can go or, you know, the community can go and pray and our elders can go. And so I think it's, um, I guess I just wanted to leave that in there as far as like how whether we're in rural areas or whether we're in these highly populated areas um one of the things that i think is going to be most important moving forward is is how we keep um indigenous people at, at the forefront of a lot of those like bigger decision making processes and especially with the air like the idea of like future planning right I mean in this country it's such a new country that people don't think five years behind or five years ahead of now um, but indigenous people we have those stories like we've we've seen the change in these areas in these place-based systems for over the hundred years, you know, our elders remember what it was like when they were kids and how much it's changed in their lifetimes. And so I think like that perspective in and of itself needs to be integrated at, at a more important, like a, a bigger political level or a bigger decision-making level, whether it's within our own homelands or outside, like not outside our homelands, but um, trying to create those networks to drive some of those Long, long term planning conversations, I think, is really important. Well, also in, in a lot of the West, there's been a kind of tendency to make parks, like national parks, yeah. that are not developed, that are maintained as clean or, you know, designated as wilderness. Yeah. And then everything else outside the park is, is kind of um, free for all. Free for all. And it, we start to see a lot of um, cracks in that system and a, a real imbalance with that kind of um, manage, land and water resource management, right? Yeah, yeah. And human nature, I mean, like it's thinking about parks, right? And I think like COVID, for a lot of environmentalists, I think the pandemic really showed how we don't have enough natural, like, I don't want to say like, I, I guess when we were all being kind of pushed to our extremes as far as what we can do, like how we can preserve our mental health, um, as a society being cooped up in our homes, um, how important parks and trees and places to go like walking 
um, are important for like a sane mind in general and how we haven't done enough to, to actually, like we don't have even that infrastructure that will like wilderness set asides to be able to, for our entire population to be able to, to access that. And I think whether you're coming from an urban area, you know, I, I goes back to like environmental justice, but in urban areas, you're not gonna, you know, there's a lot of families that have to travel miles to go to the nearest park um, so that the kids can get outside and play and enjoy it. Um, and so I think like finding, I think that I'm hoping at least that, you know, when we're allocating our budgets, right, um, at a poli like political level that we also see the importance of um, maintaining and, and putting resources towards what it takes to, to provide that, that resource for the public too. Um, because, I mean, if we leave it up to corporations, which is what we've kind of done in Tahoe, right, to corporate interests, then things get managed for the value um, and not for what's best for the land and, and the ecosystem and what's ultimately best for people. Wow. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Great uh, about your area and everything. And yeah. uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, and I appreciate you um, reaching out to me when you did. It was like perfect timing. I had just resigned from my job for, uh, mm. it was a, came a little bit, I don't even want to say a little bit, but it was a not, the healthiest work environment. Um, so I decided to resign, but it was a, like a really challenging decision to make make that decision. Like I was going back and forth, back and forth. Um, but then like when you reached out, it was also kind of forced me to start thinking about the things that are most important to me and the things like that I wanna put my work towards. And I just spent nine months doing important work, but not necessarily what I wanted to do. And so it was an, this is a, a healthy, uh, I guess, like activity or whatever <laughs> to get, to get like my feet back under me and to, to really start thinking about, you know, what's most important, what are the things that, that I should be working on to help with these, you know, these issues that are at such a large scale. So thank you for having me. It was awesome. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll um, be in touch when it's online. Um, okay, sounds good. <laughs> Alrighty, take care. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>